Hey, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Joseph Koppis, and today I'm joined by my guest, Dr. Nick Schmittelkoffer. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Dr. Joe. Uh, I really appreciate it. I think this is a great idea, and um, all these podcasts you've been putting up have been really beneficial for us. So. Thanks. Uh, and me and Dr. Nick work together downtown, so this is, of course, a special, special interview for me. Yeah. Um, but Dr. Nick, before we get into the topic of keto, which I know you're passionate about, mm -hmm. talk to us about how you got into the field of functional neurology and your interest in this stuff. Of course. Um, so, of course, when I was a, in high school, um, I was a baseball player, a football player, and I really wanted to kind of get into sports and help people um, heal better. I wanted to um, basically be either like a physical therapist, maybe a medical doctor. Then a chiropractor came into my health class, and I thought, Oh, this is something I could do. And of course, I looked it up and I saw nutrition was there. And I was like, I really like nutrition. If I'm going to learn more nutrition, that can be uh, helpful, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I decided to kind of research it more. And then basically, I went pre med in, in college to go to chiropractic school and become a sports chiropractor. And it was my second trimester, so just within the first year of, uh, of school, that I learned about neurology. And I was like, Hmm, I, maybe I can do this. And um, I did, I was like a biology and neuroscience double major in, in college. So it was kind of like, I already had an interest in neurology. Um, but when I heard Dr. Carrick talk, um, I went to um, a conference in Washington, D.C. and I heard him talk live. Um, and I thought, man, this is something I really want to do. So um, I got in touch with people that were around school um, and one of them happened to be Dr. George Michaelopoulos. So I started shadowing him a lot. And um, from there, is, the rest is kind of history. I just started taking a lot of classes and learned as much as I could because I wanted to help people that had concussions. I wanted to help people that had brain issues that weren't really getting it from the medical neurologist or from traditional care. So Awesome. That's a great story. Um, and today you wanted to talk about the ketogenic diet, right? Yes. Okay. So for those who aren't aware, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about what keto is or what, about keto, mm -hmm. but can you just kind of break down exactly what keto is? Of course. Mm -hmm. So the ketogenic diet, um, it's a tough one because it, it's like this fad diet for weight loss. Um, and yes, you can burn a lot of fat with, with this diet. But at the same time, this ketogenic diet is all about getting into a state of ketosis. And so nutritional ketosis is basically increasing the amount of ketone bodies in your blood. And there's different rates, but um, generally if you're on a full ketogenic diet, you get to like seven to eight nano or millimoles per liter in your blood. But you, there's low grade ketosis, mid grade, um, and then high grade. Mm -hmm. and with this nutritional ketosis, the only way to increase ketone bodies in your blood is to either take them, because there are ketone supplements out there, and we can talk about that in the future, mm -hmm. um, but the only other way is to decrease your carbohydrate load. And by decreasing carbohydrate load, you are basically putting your cells in starvation mode. And this starvation ability um, is then going to change how genes are turned on and off so that you start running on fat. And when you start running on fat, then you start making ketone bodies in your liver. And those ketone bodies can be used as fuel in every cell in your body, except for red blood cells. Um, but for the most part, it's used by the brain. And the brain really loves running on ketone bodies because it's just more efficient okay. in general. Which is obviously very important for the things that we do here, of um, seeing a lot of complex neurological cases. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of break down, well first, can you break down kind of what a typical diet or foods that are acceptable on keto versus some foods that might not be acceptable on keto? Yeah, maybe? of course. Um, so basically it's a high fat diet. Mm -hmm. We generally look at 70% of your calories from fat. And then maybe like 20, 25 from protein, and then about five from carbohydrates. So the first thing you have to do is you have to decrease 
the amount of carbohydrates you have. Um, and that's going to be basically all of your processed foods, all of your breads and starches, um, most fruits and, and some vegetables. And so that's like, um, like for sure no-goes a lot, a lot of times are fruits. Um, there's only a few fruits that you really can eat. And, uh, and we can talk about that more later, but it's basically berries. Um, and then the low carb like avocados and olives. Um, as far as fats, all fats are good. And the reason why fat is good for us um, is because we are made up of fat. We actually have, uh, we need two essential fatty acids um, versus like there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Um, and then we have essential proteins or essential amino acids as well. And so with the fats, um, saturated fat is good. Um, monounsaturated fat, that's more like from nuts and avocados and olives, um, olive oil. And then... Uh, polyunsaturated fats. Now these are the ones that you have either omega-3 or omega-6. And omega-6 are generally more inflammatory um, and omega-3 are going to be the the ones that are anti-inflammatory. Those are like from fish, um, fish oil or um, yeah. The omega-6 ones though, so those would be the one kind of fat that I would say like you stay away from. Um, and those are all from vegetable oils. So soybean oil, peanut oil, um, sunflower oil, canola oil, everyone thinks canola oil is a little better, but it's really not. Mm -hmm. um, and then most trans fats. Now trans fats in general have been taken out of, of our foods. Um, if there's a little bit of trans fat in foods, they, they can't like put it on the label. So you don't necessarily know. Mm -hmm. um, but those are gonna be from like in like heavy whipping cream and um, pro more processed oils, like those vegetable oils, so. Okay, very good. Um, and then again, what, uh, what types of conditions or what types of patients or people do you typically recommend this diet to? Who does it really benefit the most? Of course. Um, so this diet kind of came into fruition in the uh, um, 1920s for epilepsy. And so kids or, or even adults with epilepsy that were not getting benefit from medication um, somebody just thought that, hey, maybe the ketogenic diet could be um, effective. And the reason why is because with epilepsy, we have this abnormal amount of electrical activity in the brain. Mm -hmm. And it's normally because our neurons, our cells, are destabilized. So we don't have proper ion flow back and forth in between the cell. Mm -hmm. And this leads to what's called glutamate toxicity or excitotoxicity. And it can, this the destabilization of membranes. And so ketones and ketone bodies have kind of been shown to be a better efficient energy source for, for the brain and therefore can also decrease inflammation, decrease free radicals, and then that can kind of lower that glutamate toxicity. Um, and so for epilepsy, it's like kind of a standard. And traditionally in the medical world, people are still going to try you on or most doctors are going to try one drug if it doesn't work they're going to try another one and then they may try a third before they go to uh, before they go to a ketogenic diet i would say anybody on epilepsy should be on a ketogenic diet at least to start or at least completely decrease carbohydrates as much as possible um, and maybe not go full keto then besides epilepsy um, i would say there's a lot of uh, indications for this diet. Um, I'm for sure going to talk about it to most of my concussion patients, especially if they're long-standing concussions, um, or right after someone has a concussion. And the reason why right after someone, um, it's a great acute management because mm -hmm. when we have a concussion, we have this inflammation and we have uh, this high need for energy in order to basically get, basically handle the damage. Mm -hmm. um, clear out waste from our cells. But at the same time, we don't use glucose as well. So our neurons kind of shut off and they don't increase glucose into the cell for energy. They also, there's also a decreased blood flow into the brain as well. So that combination is going to cause basically a lack of energy production and therefore you can't heal from the concussion. At the same time, it leads to reactive oxygen species, free radicals, inflammation that we just don't need. 
And so fasting first for the first 24 hours and then going on a ketogenic diet for maybe a week after mm -hmm. a, right after a concussion um, is really beneficial because these ketones are more efficient for the or more efficient for the brain. It's actually like um, ketones have basically have four carbons. And so they make for one ketone body, it makes 27 ATP molecules. ATP molecules are the energy that is needed for uh, for a for a cell. Mm -hmm. And so four to 27 versus glucose is like 36 ATP molecules uh, per six carbons. So it's about two more molecules ATP per carbon, um, which is more efficient, one in that sense. And glucose is what's going to cause an increase in lactic acid and more inflammation versus ketones are anti-inflammatory. So overall, it's really beneficial for those patients as well. And then um, other patients would be patients with depression or neurodegenerative diseases. Both of those are very, very common with uh, poor neuroinflammation. And, and there's been benefits in the, in the research for that as well. Okay. Um, and uh, further with the concussion patients, how long would you typically expect a concussion patient to remain on the keto diet? Is this something you know, they should probably stay on for a long period of time? Is it short term? What, what's your typical recommendation? Yeah, I would say for if it's an acute concussion, I would say one week. So fast for 18 to 24 hours right after the hit. Um, you don't need any food, especially after a concussion. It can lead to leaky gut issues as well. You don't want to be putting extra food, and that could lead to other issues down the road. Mm -hmm. um, so 20, 18 to 24 hours of fasting, followed by the ketogenic diet for maybe a week, and then they can slowly start increasing carbs again after that. Okay. Um, for people that are more post-concussive and um, have had really, really poor symptoms for a while, um, I may have them on the ketogenic diet for a longer term, maybe more like a month to two months, maybe three. Okay. Um, but generally, generally going the more higher fat route, lower carbs in general. Okay. Then. Okay. So with every diet, there are people who benefit from it and there are people who it may not be the best idea for. Uh, what are some maybe contraindications or people who should maybe think twice before doing keto? Of course. Um, so really there's only some strict contraindications um, that are, there's only a few of them. There are people that have deficiencies in like carnitine or other like fat transport molecules. And so carnitine helps basically transfer our fats from inside of our cell into our mitochondria for energy. And so those people, but most of those people know that they have a genetic disorder from birth and that they can't handle a lot of fat. Um, so there's like six or seven conditions that all have uh, basically fat transfer uh, problems. Then more acute conditions would be people that have like acute pancreatitis or acute liver disease, um, acute gallbladder disease, just those things. But again, those are all things that are pretty active in there. If people have chronic issues with their liver or gallbladder, they can still benefit. Um, it may just take a little bit of time. So you just would have to kind of increase your fat slowly so that you don't overload the gallbladder, which has to help break down to digest those fats. Mm -hmm. And then there are like, um, for instance, uh, pregnant women and then uh, birth or breastfeeding mothers. Uh, a lot of people have been saying like stay away if you're um, for a ketogenic diet, but there's also a lot of evidence that it can be beneficial. For instance, um, babies use ketones. And so when, for instance, one's pregnant, the a mother is more likely to become insulin resistant or a carrying, uh, a carrying woman is going to become more likely to be insulin resistant. And that is because the baby is taking up all the energy and a lot of the glucose but the fetus will also be able to make ketone bodies as well and can utilize ketone bodies. So it's not anything against the, the, the fetus to be running on a good quality ketogenic diet. Um, at the same time, breastfeeding mothers, we know that babies need a good amount of fat and DHA, which is gonna be very high, it's an omega-3 fatty acid, um, It'll, you'll generally get more of it when you're on a ketogenic diet and that can help the baby to thrive. Um, so 
it's really just something that you got to make sure you have a lot, not a nutrients in. So you may need to take a multivitamin. You may need to um, structure in a way where you're getting good quality vitamins within your food, but it's still very possible. And then the same thing goes to people with thyroid issues. So a lot of people say that, oh, if you have a thyroid problem, you can't be on a ketogenic diet because the ketogenic diet is going to decrease thyroid hormone function. That's not necessarily true. Um, it does decrease how much thyroid hormone is produced from the thyroid gland. But at the same time, because the thyroid hormone is not needed as much for glucose metabolism. So actually your cells, every single cell in your body has a thyroid receptor and they become more sensitized to the thyroid hormone. Therefore, you don't need as much of it. So you're going to be on the lower end of your, of your thyroid, um, of your T3, your T4 hormone level, but your TSH, the, the part that's actually going to signal to the thyroid gland that we need more of it, is not going to be elevated. And again, it goes back to symptoms. Um, are people cold intolerant with, mm -hmm. their, with their thyroid issues? Are, um, are they gaining weight? Probably not on a ketogenic diet. Um, are they, do they have a lack of sweating? Those kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. And so it really just depends on if you go with the ketogenic diet, your thyroid probably won't suffer as long as you um, take care of your body as well. So, Very good. So for those who are interested in pursuing this diet, uh, can you give us like a step-by-step -step guide on how to do it correctly and how to avoid doing it incorrectly? Of course. So first thing is a lot of people, there's like a couple different ways to, to do keto. And you can do it like a clean keto or a dirty keto. That's pretty common terms. And so I would say like a dirty keto is someone that is eating a bunch of highly processed meats, um, like sliced turkey, sliced ham, those kind of things. Um, a lot of dairy, like more than one third of their calories from dairy, whether that be uh, cheeses or, or milk or heavy whipping cream, um, just because dairy can be inflammatory. And then the uh, inflammatory omega-6 oils, all those vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. um, so really just like, Staying away from those are super important. And then going for more of that clean keto, um, again, 70% of the calories should be from fat. 25, 20 from protein and 5% from carbs. Um, for most people, most Americans, especially on a standard American diet, they're eating probably about 200 to 150, maybe probably mostly over 100 grams of carbohydrates per day. And on a ketogenic diet, you want to get that down to about 20 to 30 net carbs. Net carbs is basically the amount of carbs you have minus the amount of fiber and the amount of like sugar alcohols that might be there. Mm -hmm. And that's your net carbs because fiber and sugar alcohols don't get absorbed. And so you want to get down to 20 to 30. So if you're someone that eats like 150 grams of carbs a day, mm -hmm. I would take maybe a week to lower that and lower that, try to cut that in half. Um, before you actually start because a lot of times when we drop our carbs too fast um, we ha can get what's called the keto flu and the keto flu is it's not like a virus or an infection or anything but it's just something that people feel really fatigued mm -hmm. um, people they don't have energy they um, might just randomly fall asleep um, they, they feel like their workouts aren't very good, they get sore, they maybe muscles start cramping. And all of that, it, to me, is due to hydration levels and salt. So when you start lowering carbohydrates, you don't get an insulin response. Mm -hmm. You don't get as much of an insulin response. The combination of lowering carbohydrates and not getting insulin are going to take away muscle glycogen. Muscle glycogen is what kind of holds on to water. And so if we take away that muscle glycogen, water leaves, and therefore we get dehydrated. At the same time, insulin is a factor that, and it doesn't only help us absorb glucose into our cells, but it also helps us prevent sodium excretion from our kidneys. And so if we don't have a lot of insulin, then we're gonna be getting rid of water and sodium or salt from our kidneys mm -hmm. uh, in our urine. And so the biggest thing is to increase salt to add salt to foods. Um, 
you're not going to be getting a lot of salt from foods because you're not going to be eating a lot of prepackaged processed foods that have mostly salt. Mm -hmm. So you want to salt, you know, salt on your salad. You want to put salt on your meat. You want to put salt on your cooked vegetables, um, all those things. And you probably want to go for about five grams of salt a day, um, which is kind of a lot. That's almost, it's a little over a teaspoon um, per day. And, and that should help along with drinking a good amount of water, whether that's like 50 to 75% of your body weight from water. Mm -hmm. um, so those are a couple main things to kind of get over the keto flu. Um, but then from there, after just dropping those carbohydrates, just to try to get good high quality fats. Um, and all animal fats are really good. So animal fats from red meat, from um, the skin on chicken wings, um, all those are really good. But you also want to get monounsaturated fat. Monounsaturated fat comes from avocado oil, olive oil, uh, avocados and olives, uh, nuts like Brazil nuts, walnuts, macadamia nuts, hazelnuts, all those are really good to get high quality fats in. Um, and speaking of avocado oil, since I was talking about it, uh, that would be a great one to cook in because you really don't want to cook in olive oil. All those, if you're cooking in olive oil that is kind of a lower heat uh, cooking oil, mm -hmm. then that can lead to rancidity and mm -hmm. more reactive oxygen species, and you don't want to be putting that into your body. So you'd yeah. rather use a higher heat oil for that. Um, so that's a really good way to get a lot of fats. And then when it comes to carbohydrates, you want to stick to high fiber vegetables. So spinach, broccoli, uh, kale, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, um, those kind of things. Um, then berries are good when it comes to fruits. Avocados are technically a fruit. Olives are technically a fruit. Those are those are good. Um, but when it comes to that, that's about it with vegetables. And um, there's a few others that, that I probably missed, but it's the sh more sugary vegetables or Mm -hmm. um, like bell peppers and mm -hmm. uh, squashes or tubers like sweet potatoes that you want right, to stay right, away from. Right. So, um, and that's not to say that you can't ever have them mm -hmm. because just because this diet is like this, if you're doing a hard workout, that's going to really deplete a lot of energy and having a little bit higher carb right after that workout is actually beneficial and it's not going to kick you out of ketosis mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, we generally say you can't keep, you can't cheat on a ketogenic diet because you kind of lose that, um, that, that steam of, of building into that, ke uh, that ketosis state and that fat burning state. But at the same time, if you've been on it for let's say a month mm -hmm. and you want to have a cheat meal, that's okay. As long as you get right back on it the next mm -hmm. day. Um, or again, after a hard workout. So, okay. Uh, and, the uh, the athlete portion that you mentioned that, that brings me to my next question, actually. Um, is there a subset of athlete that thrives on the keto diet? Is there a subset of athlete that, you know, maybe doesn't, how do you consolidate yeah. that? I would say I would never recommend the ketogenic diet to a like professional athlete that is a hockey player that's actually doing it maybe if just had a concussion and they're going to be out that's different but mm -hmm. um but an athlete that's um, a hockey player that is a uh, baseball football player rugby um, anything that's a little bit higher intensity that needs more power and strength mm -hmm. um, along with like anaerobic activity their bodies just need a ton of food um, they need they're almost like eating for a living to supply their energy for what they're doing mm -hmm. and if they're eating a ketogenic diet chances are it's not going to be adequate they're not going to be able to get enough uh, calories in order mm -hmm. to, to fulfill that so I wouldn't really recommend that um, when it comes to you know athletes that are more recreational I think uh, runners I think swimmers I think most aerobic activity bikers cyclists mm -hmm. um, can really thrive on a ketogenic diet um, because that fat burning can really help them overcome um, the glucose metabolism that happens in long distance runs or, or, or swimming. And at the same time, you have that grape area where it's like, if you're a professional runner, um, do you really want to be doing it? Or um, even like high school athletes, should high school athletes be doing it? 
Probably not. Um, again, they're generally growing. They're trying to gain more muscle. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to maybe avoid avoid recommending it to those to those people. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So what would you say are the most common questions uh, that people have for you as they begin their journey on this diet? Well, there's a lot of them. The, the keto flu was for sure one. Mm -hmm. um, I would say maybe the most important one that we haven't talked about yet would be cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And isn't eating like high saturated fat and cholesterol bad for us? Mm -hmm. And I can say emphatically no. Um, for the most part, when we're eating saturated fat and cholesterol, we should be using that and putting that into our bodies. Mm -hmm. Cholesterol is actually a really important nutrient for us because uh, it is the backbone to all of our steroid or sex hormones. So uh, cortisol, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. It is also in 25% of our cell membranes to help stabilize our cell membranes. And then it's actually used to make vitamin D. So mm -hmm. When we go outside and get UV rays in the sun, what happens is it hits our skin and then there is a molecule that was formed from uh, cholesterol that then is converted into vitamin D. And so we need cholesterol in our body. Now, the higher cholesterol levels in our blood have been related to heart disease and atherosclerosis and other things. But a lot of these studies are epidemiological studies, observational studies that don't really pan out when we look at more interventional studies um, and so there's there's a lot of like debate in in many fields that whether ldl is good or bad or cholesterol is good or bad um, i'm going to say in the presence of insulin resistance so in the presence of um, higher carbs higher sugar a higher cholesterol level a higher ldl is probably bad because that can what that's what can be to the LDL kind of getting stuck in arteries and leading to plaque formation. At the same time, if you're on a ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. that insulin resistance, that um, that higher glucose level will come down. So we get a more stable glucose, uh, blood glucose, and therefore that doesn't really lead to um, high rates of cardiovascular disease. And that's been shown in a lot of epidemiological studies that when you lower insulin resistance, then LDL is not much of a factor when it comes mm -hmm. to increasing those. Um, and that goes the same with saturated fat animal fats. Um, they're used for energy. So, Okay, very good. So Dr. Nick, we are just about out of time, but I wanted to make sure that we budgeted enough time at the end to give you the time to give us any final thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, anything we may not have covered uh, over the course of this interview. Yeah, of course. Um, let's look at my notes here quick. <laughs> um, so this is more into like the, the science, I guess, behind you know, ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. um, and they're still coming out with more thoughts on like what it actually is doing. And uh, speaking of which, I did forget one thing. So um, there's ways that it decreases inflammation by basically turning off genes mm -hmm. and, and, and changing genes. Uh, it enhances mitochondria. Um, it is going to uh, increased brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which helps with neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. um, it's also going to change the correlation between um, AMP kinase and mTOR. Um, these are kind of related to, like mTOR has been related to cancer causing because it leads to proliferation of cells. Mm -hmm. And so it actually decreases mTOR. It increases sirtuin genes. Sirtuin genes are more for longevity. So it's pretty cool the what what ketone bodies can do, beta-hydroxybutyrate uh, being the main one. But the one other thing is that a lot of people question, well, what happens to the gut microbiome mm. when I'm on a ketogenic diet? Yeah. And because we're told that we need good amount of plant fiber to feed our gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. However, the gut microbiome is going to change based on whatever we're eating. And if we are healthy, then the gut microbiome is going to be healthy. Um, it may not be as it may not be like somebody who's vegetarian, vegan, omnivore, whatever, but it's going to be still the microbiome that fits for you. And so the ketogenic microbiome is definitely a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And the beta hydroxybutyrate, those ketone bodies, have actually been shown to 
um, go and improve the microbiome function and also improve, basically feed the, the cells of our intestines that normally the microbiome would do by feeding on plants and plant fiber. And there's been research in rats and mice that for those with epilepsy, um, if rats were given epilepsy and given the ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. they improve. But if we take all the microbiome out and then put them on a ketogenic diet, they don't get that improvement. So mm -hmm. clearly there's something going on, not only with just the state of ketosis, mm -hmm. but also the microbiome that is involved with that ketogenic diet. So that's a pretty cool thing. And again, the yeah. microbiome is something that we have, we think we know a ton about, but we don't know nearly enough. And um, there's a lot of research going into it, which is pretty cool and fascinating, but we just don't know enough about it to say whether you have a good or bad microbiome. Yeah, so. that's very true. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Nick. So far, this has been fantastic. You know, you shared a lot of great information on a topic that, you know, a lot of people might think they know about, but probably actually don't know mm -hmm. as much as they think. Yep. Um, so if people or our listeners and viewers wanted to get a hold of you or learn more about you and what you do, uh, where would they do that? How would they do that? Um, of course. So obviously we work here together at uh, the Neurologic Wellness Institute. We both work downtown Chicago. And so you can get on our website, the neurowellnessinstitute.com. Um, my email would be drdr.nick at neurowellnessinstitute.com. Um, you can also find me on Instagram. Um, mm -hmm. I do a lot of educational posts on the ketogenic diet, um, on high fat, low carb, um, and d different benefits on that. My Instagram handle is at dr.nick, N-I-C-K, Schmied, S-C-H-M-E-E-D. So... Very yeah, good. All those are good places. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Dr. Nick. This has been great. Uh, and then from your host, be well. Mm -hmm.